today, Rachel Carter. She is a life and transition coach. She has run many marathons and half marathons. And uh, Rachel has found her own um, equation for happiness and fulfillment. And so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you today, uh, Rachel Carter.
first thing I had to do when I got this disease was to learn how to normalize it. It's a shocking thing to happen. I was 24 when I first got diagnosed, and I was severely, my first symptom was severe depression. Like, I'm talking not leaving the house, depression. I tried to attempt a suicide a couple times. I have um, gone from, you know, I couldn't use my hand at all, and that was really hard because I was trying to be a bartender at the time, and my arm just wouldn't work. And I, sometimes I have to crawl up the stairs to my bed because I get so tired. Sometimes I have to um, just leave work and basically crawl to my car because I get so tired and my is so bad. And sometimes I get burning so bad I can't even think. So how do you normalize this and talk about this with people that don't understand? It certainly doesn't work to keep it all inside. So you have to find your own language in order to normalize it. If you don't talk about it, as a normal thing, then it feels like you're hiding something horrible. And I would doubt that anybody has the strength to hide this inside them and not share it and go on and be okay, unless you're going home crying in the night, and that's not what we want. So you normalize it, you talk about it, you find your own language, and you find your team. I um, I have my team, I have my, um, I'm not talking about the team that you read about in the books, like, of course, I had my, my neurologist and my GP and my, you know, my um, physical therapist and my counselor. This is or psychiatrist. You know, this is not the team I'm talking about. The team I'm talking about is the ones you go to when you don't know what to do and they know what to do. I'm talking about Erica Watson. When I have a panic attack and I don't know what to do and I'm trying to get through something, she knows how to talk me down. <laughs> I'm talking about my husband, who I used to try to always say, "Oh, I'm fine," because I didn't want him to worry, but. I realized that if I don't know what's going on, he just gets really stressed out. So it's easy, it's so much easier to say, I have the irritant, and he knows what that means. You know, the creepy crawly bugs under your skin. Or I have hollow bumps, and he knows what that means, that you know, my arm hurts so bad, but it's you know, not real pain. But he knows what all these terms mean. I have my dad, he calls me up and says, how you doing? And I'm like, I'm fine. That's not your dad. It means I feel like crap, but I don't want to talk about it. So he tells me, get home, because he doesn't want me to cry on the phone. <laughs> and then call him back. <laughs> I have my mom, of course, my counselor. All these people are so special to me, and my kids, oh my gosh, my kids. I can't hide it from my kids. They see me, they see me cry, and they know that, <laughs> and I cry really because I do. He comes up to me and says, hey, you need mommy? And he crawls in my lap and gives me a big hug, and all of a sudden, everything's okay. This is the team you need to develop. The people that understand what you're going through, they understand your language, and they want to help you. So let them help you, because they want to. So you find your team that you need to hang on to them. Those are the picture of my family. Asking for help has been something that's been really hard for me. I um, was a grew up being a pretty physically capable person. I was, you know, the captain of my um, high school and college cheerleading team. I kind of always led every group in whatever physical activity because I not want to give up. I don't give up and I believe I can do everything and if I can't do it, I'm gonna keep trying until I get it done. So asking for help has never been something that came naturally to me. I've always wanted to just do, I'm a doer, get it done. But I find now that there are certain things I can't do, like walking across a room sometimes I can't do without help or I will bang into the wall or fall over. Sometimes I can't, like I said, put the coffee cup on the coffee lid and I could freak out and panic or I could say, no, you're right, I'm having this problem. Can you do this for me? And then it's okay. I don't have to panic because I can fill up my coffee. It's <laughs> so very important in life. Um, so I, the story I wanted to for help, and not just asking for help, but accepting help. I um, signed up to do this half marathon that I wanted to do for a long time with my friend, Erica, um, who I mentioned before, because it was all downhill, and I thought, oh, we can do that. This is going to be so easy. It was a, this was the last half marathon I did, actually. Um, and I then, while I was training, I started having a relapse, which was on my, it was on my C2 spine, and I had such horrible pain in my back. It felt like somebody was pouring a vat of boiling fat down my back and it would just burn and blister, but really nothing was happening. So I, um, and mornings are usually a lot better for me and this was in the morning and I thought it'll be okay because Erica will be there and I remember sitting on the bus on our way to the top and I was thinking, 
oh my gosh, what am I doing? And I was panicking and I wanted to tell him to stop the bus now. I need out, I need out, I need out. Because what the heck was I thinking? How am I gonna run 13 miles when I am going through this? Even downhill, I didn't think I could do it. And Erica so nicely pointed out the different smells when we got off the bus and the atmosphere and the environment. And I said, you're right. This is wonderful. I'm just gonna start taking a step and see what happens. And I did that and I just kept taking a step. That's what it comes down to, baby steps. You keep taking a step. When I got to, um, at the end of the run, I was still running, painfully, but running, and then I started to get really hot. And at the last watering station, I did not think I was going to make it. I arrived there, and I am burning, I'm crying, I'm desperate, and they said, um, the guy there in the watering station said, are you okay? Do you need a medic? And I said, no, I just have my mask, I just need to get to the end. And he said, okay, can I touch you? And I'm like, okay, weird, okay. And he, <laughs> she's making is to not feel sorry for herself and give up because it's too hard to get out of bed. It's to remind herself every day of why she wants to do this and so that she is choosing to go to work every day because this is important to her and she is important to these kids. That's what the power of choice can do. It can get you beyond what feels impossible and difficult and painful, but it can get you to where you need to be to feel fulfilled. Um, now here's the thing. <laughs> the story I was going to tell a minute ago. Um, the choosing happiness. It's not as easy as everybody says, but you know, just choose to be happy. Okay, I'll be happy. 
you know. So I have actually developed my own two-step process. First, you have to allow the bad feelings to happen. So I'm at work, and I'm thinking, man, this sucks and everything hurts, and I want to go home. And so I jump up and down, I'm like, it sucks, it sucks. I throw a fit, literally, throw a fit. And then I can move on. Because if you don't allow the bad feelings to happen, they're going to stick with you. Thank you, Gloria. And um, you have to allow the bad feelings to flow so you can let them go. Because if you don't, they're kind of stuck there. You can try to pretend to be happy despite it, but it really does suck. I mean, it does. Nobody wants to be in pain all the time. Nobody wants to not have control over their thoughts and emotions. So you have to allow that to happen. And then once you do, you can move on. Okay. Yeah, it sucks. Now what? That's your chance to choose happiness. You don't have to decide that, hey, I'm choosing to come into work because this is the best place for me ever. It's like, I'm choosing to come into work because this is better than the alternative. It's better than sitting at home feeling sorry for myself. I get to talk to people who care about me. I've had um, the same customers for a really long time. So people I talk to at work care about me and help me. And the fact that I'm doing something every day and moving forward, making my life better, that's a choice that I'm making to continue to be happy. And that's the kind of choice you can make. You have to separate it out so you're not just, okay, choose to be happy. That's it. But that seems pretty weak and it's hard to do. So you have to realize that the choice you're making is, yes, it sucks. Let that happen. Put it aside. The choice you're making is the best choice for that possible moment. It's better than the alternative. Or if you find alternatives, that's better go with that. <laughs> but that's a power of choice. No one is in charge of your own happiness except you. There's a quote by Christina Brett from The Plain Dealer. And that is absolutely true. You cannot expect somebody else to make you happy. Positive attitude. I am, um, my dad once asked me, he said, he has a friend from, that he's had since high school, which is a really long time, because he's not a spring chicken anymore. Thanks for the last mom. Same age. <laughs> um, that he asked me, he said, you know, Joe doesn't ever read the computer, so can you put together a couple of blogs that you think are really good that you've written so I can send to him? And I'm like, why does Joe want to read my blog? And he said, well, he asked me how you remain positive throughout all this. And I thought, that seems so weird to me. Like, what do you mean how I remain positive? Like, that thought never occurred to me because I don't see any other choice. So I was going for a run trying to think of which was the best blog word to pin, and all my best thinking happens during my runs, but then I usually forget it afterwards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I could choose to not be positive. I could choose to be a buffer and sit around and pout around the house and not run with my kids and try to play games even if I can't keep, keep up or you know sit on the couch and let them run around me and I'm doing something that I can do. I could choose the other way and just go upstairs and lock myself in the bedroom, which there is a time for that, we'll talk about that later. But I choose to be positive because there's no other choice. I have three kids, I have the rest of my life to live. And I intend to do so. I do not intend to let MS win. I have never given up on winning and this is not a battle I'm gonna lose either. And by winning, all I have to do is just keep a positive attitude. Know that it's gonna get better. Yeah, there's bad days, but there's better days to come. There's always tomorrow. The blessing of illness. I know it seems so ironic, but sometimes it does feel like a blessing. I remember, I noticed this first when I was a child, I got migraine headaches really bad, once a week, absolutely debilitating. I couldn't walk, I couldn't see, I couldn't, I would throw up. Um, and this was really hard for my parents to watch because I was a little teeny kid and they happened, like clockwork, once a week. <laughs> I would know the second it went away because I would have this feeling of euphoria. Like, I never felt better ever before because um, I just felt so bad before. Just to feel normal feels amazing. And that's what I find happens with MS. When I go through periods of like a month where every day hurts or every day I'm tired and I can't do anything, that first time I'm able to run again, even if it's only for three miles, I. I'm just so euphoric to be doing it because I wasn't able to do it before. And that's something that we need to take note of. That even though there are really horrible times, you have to recognize that feeling that comes next that's so good. You have to grab hold of those good feelings so you can remember them for next time when you're feeling bad.
they feel great all the time, and they don't appreciate it at all. We, we get to appreciate it. Adaptability, oh, this is the big one. This is the really big one. The thing is, even in North, everyday life, things change. As human beings, we are not made to adapt. As human beings, we are made to set things up, to know what's gonna happen, to know, you know, as cavemen, to know where the bad, scary creatures are gonna be, and when, you know, we need to eat, when daylight's gonna happen, we need to know what's going to happen. So as human beings, we're not built or made to adapt. But especially with a disease like MS, you have to adapt because every day is different. Every moment of every day is different. And um, if you don't figure out how to adapt, you're not gonna make it. You're not. So, um, like for example, my morning workout. I used to, man, you guys, I used to be in such great shape. I used to run every single day. I used to go to the gym for an hour every day, run, lift weights, ran marathons, half marathons. Um, I haven't done that for a little while now. I've been going through a rough patch. Actually, right now, I think I'm having a relapse. But, um, so I haven't run for a while, but the thing is, you have to, I, I'm not gonna give up on it completely. I have found out that I have to do it first thing in the morning. I found out that yoga can be just as gratifying as a good workout at the gym. I found out that um, I can have just as much fun just going for a walk as I can running. This is adaptability. This is what we need to learn to do. Don't give up on having coffee. Have somebody else put the lid on for you. This is adaptability. And this is what's gonna get us through for the next however many years. Because things are gonna change every day. And you know, you may wake up feeling great, go to work, go start something, and then one o'clock hits and boom, you crash. Are you gonna let it ruin your entire life? Or are you going to adapt? Are you going to do something else for the rest of the day because you just couldn't do what you were planning on? You have to be able to adapt. Good enough. <laughs> this is a good one. I had, because um, I'm a coach, so I hired a, my own coach to help me with something. And we were talking about how I'm going to move forward in my business and how I'm going to um, do this and that. And she's like, Rachel, all I'm hearing from you is like, you can't do this yet. You like, I try to do everything. I try to um, be perfect. I try to have the perfect house. As somebody with, um, I have anxiety, OCD, depression, and this weird, as if it's possible, this weird need to be seen as perfect, I get really upset when my house is a mess. And when I haven't completed everything that I need to at work and then gone home and been a perfect mom, made a perfect dinner, and then worked on building my business outside, right? I can no longer do all of that all the time. And she said, Rachel, the first thing I think you need to do to move forward is figure out how to do things half assed. I want you to learn half ass code. And so I did, and then I immediately threw it off. I'm like, that's horrible. I don't like that at all. <laughs> Screw that. So I am, but I promised to work on it, and I, I was just doing things good enough. I realized that if I got the laundry done, and then put in the laundry basket and left it out the front of my bed, that's good enough. It's gonna get folded and put away, which before would have driven me nuts, but with my new little thing good enough, it was okay, I could handle it. And I realized I could go home and go to bed with my house with toys all over it because that was good enough. My kids were still happy. My kids were still alive. They got fed. It was good enough. Or if I don't have energy, it's okay to feed them cereal. That's good enough. They're still alive and they still love me and they still feel loved. They just can't always get a great dinner. And I realized after the, um, doing that exercise that I actually really like doing things half ass. It is such a relief to not have all that pressure. I can still get stuff done, and I just didn't have all the pressure on me to make it great. Because not everything can be great, but you're still doing it. And that's good. Um, and so I just said this one, Regina Brett, I love her. She has lots of great quotes from her. Um, she wrote a magazine article just one of you years. No matter how you feel, get up, dress up, and show up. Doesn't matter if it works out perfectly, but hey, we went and made enough here. <laughs> we were good enough. <laughs> um, a day off. So um, here's a quote for this. Work harder to appreciate your ordinary day. The fact is, um, every day is not good. Every day is not good. So you wake up and you 
get up to do something and it turns out, oh my God, I can't do anything today. I can't even get to the shower. <laughs> I need to sleep for another couple hours. I can't go to work today. I can't do any of that. But allowing yourself to have a day off and instead of thinking about it as a bad day and it sucks and it's horrible, you allow yourself to have a day off where you're taking care of yourself, you're doing what you need to do, which is taking care of yourself physically and mentally so that you can the next day tackle a new project or you can that evening give whoever is loved in your home hugs and kisses. And it's a benefit. Let yourself have a day off so that you can have a better day the next day. It's okay to just give up on days. Some days, and this is where I said I bring this up later, some days I get home from work and I say, gosh, I'm done. I go upstairs and I lock my bedroom door and he feeds the kids and I just go to sleep at five o'clock because it's done. But I'm able, whereas it used to really depress me and I'm lying in bed and cry and oh my God, I can't do this. You know, instead of that now, I say, oh my God, so nice that I can have a day off and take care of myself. I am doing something. I'm taking care of myself so that I can be better the next day. And now I find it a relief. It's all about how you choose it. This goes back to changing your reality. It's not, you know, my life sucks because I have a mess. It's, yes, I have a mess, so I am adapting by giving myself more time off so that next, the next day can be a better day because there's always a next day. So you can go home, go to bed, and be sad, but just know that the next day feels so better. <coughs> the unknown. The worst part of having MS for me Everybody needs to have their own way out. 
some, you have to have a tool. Of course, when everything feels out of control, you have to have a tool like to how to express yourself. I need a special place. Another one of my favorite things. This was um, the place that I was with my little daughter when my other two kids had came there over the weekend to love you. It's actually almost very, very cute. Um, and, but this is my special place. This is my parents' house. When I go there, They will take care of the kids, and I don't have to do anything but relax. You have to find a special place you can go when you need because sometimes you can't, you just can't take another day of everything. And when you're at home, you still have everything. Even though you think you're gonna plan a, um, a weekend to relax, you end up, you end up worrying about the chores, the laundry, but everything that's there, and you really need a break. So find a special place. It's my other <laughs> special favorite place. It's hard to see on the screen right here, but that is my bathtub. That's where I get to go, <laughs> lock the door, take my books, light my candles, and my husky nose kids are not to interrupt me, and I take a glass of wine, and I get some bubbles, and I can stay in there for hours. Because sometimes you just need that. Your quiet time to just feel complete, and feel to be who you are. Also a great place to meditate, because, and if anybody has a skin burn pain, by the way, I do this all the time, it actually helps take that away for me because um, it's another sensation on your skin. So if you have that, you should try. But um, finding a special place is really important to mental health. Forward movement. As a person, as a human being, it is in your nature to be doing something, to be moving forward, to be progressing somehow in life. If you are doing this, it's very hard. You, you know, can be complacent. So you know, So we always have to have forward movement. And so I'm going to speak a little bit on how to make that happen. First thing is acceptance. Now, I am not talking about accepting the fact that I have a mess and I'm not able to do this anymore. That's not what I think accepting is. I've talked to a lot of different people with different forms of MS. Because um, I don't have, I have relapse and remitting still. I think, we'll see. <laughs> um, but I've talked to a lot of people progressive MS. to accept it is what it is and this is the best it gets. I am always trying to move forward and get better. But what I can accept is that I have a mess, I need to find tools, and I need to work harder every day to make my life better. And that is accepting. I know I have a mess. And if something happens, okay, I can accept that because I have a mess. But I recognize it as a mess, not as me, not as my life, but I recognize it as know that, hey, I can move forward tomorrow. Today's the day to rest. But you don't give up on moving forward. You don't let it knock you on your ass. You get up and you fight back. Accepting again. I am, um, another thing that I was reminded of when, or thought about a lot when dad asked me to send a couple of my big, or good blogs for some of his to um, explain how I kept a really good attitude all the time is, um, the truth is, I'm, um, I think I'm really lucky to just be 
born with a great attitude. I remember before I had MS, I um, was able to, I did everything, man. I traveled, I backpacked through Europe alone when I was 20. I, um, even when I had MS, I ran two marathons. I started training for the first one three months after I gave birth to my baby. I just have an innate need to be great. So I just have a need for greatness. And I'm not talking about like, oh, well, I'm, you know, an awesome person, man, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. But I want to feel that I'm doing the best I can in this world, that I am making a mark on this world, doing what I can to help others. So um, that is something I was born with, and I'm lucky for that. But I have figured out how you can do it, um, even if it's not natural. And I think it's a three-step process. First, I think you will never succeed if you don't believe you're going to succeed. If you never try, you can't do it. You have to believe you'll succeed no matter what. So when I start a run, I believe that I will succeed in that run. And that means I will run. I will start. It doesn't mean I'm going to run 10 miles. It means I will go and run some. It doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I know I can start. So I can believe I can succeed. Don't give up if you don't make it the first time. So I didn't make 10 miles today, even though that was on my training schedule. Well, I can try again tomorrow. Not a big deal. The thing is, you just don't give up on your goals. So I didn't make it to work. But I'm not going to quit work because I didn't work this week because I don't know that I can't work next week. So you just keep trying. And then the other thing is to be <laughs> realistic about what you believe success to be. Um, you can't go into something thinking, wow, I'm going to be the best at this, and I know it's going to work out perfectly no matter what. When I showed up here this morning, I had my plan was to have the screen facing me so I'd remember every story and everything and not have to look behind my shoulder. Well, that didn't work out, so I'm looking behind my shoulder. I'm, but I don't feel that this is a failure. This is success because my realistic view was that this will happen. It doesn't have to happen exactly as I planned it, but I will do my best. And that's success. Grit. My favorite phrase. Somebody told me about this. He said, I said, um, I was coaching them on a new promotion. I'm like, how, so how do you think you're going to uh, make this work? Because he really had no idea what his new responsibilities were or how to pull them off or who to ask or anything. He kind of felt thrown out there. I'm like, so how are you going to make this work? I said, grit. I said, what's grit? What
I give my balls to God. Okay, here you go. I can't deal with this today. There you are. Another really good thing that I do also is I have this little yellow box. It's yellow because that's my happy color, my favorite color. And it has a gold bow on it, so it's nice and pretty and shiny and pretty and she's got some great hair. And sometimes I just have to put all those balls, put them in my box, and they can stay there until tomorrow. And if they're still important tomorrow, I'm going to throw them out. If I haven't thought about it in a month, they're gone. So if you want to put any of your balls in my box, it's right there. So it's available. <laughs> So um, this is my this is my really fancy dinner, simplified. One night my husband had to leave and I was all alone at home. He left with my mom and my kids and I was gonna meet them later. And I was having a really rough time, like not feeling well at all. And so I'm like, I can't even feed myself, but I wanted to have a nice relaxing dinner. So I poured myself a glass of wine and I just made a dinner out of cut up cheese and salon that I got at the store. And that felt so fancy and so perfect to me. And it was so simple. If you make things simple, it's so much easier. I, um, with my weird perfectionist thing I have going on, I always want my house to be great and perfect, but I realize it can't be because I can't constantly be picking up after everybody and putting things away because I come home and I'm tired. Or I wake up and I'm tired, <laughs> you know? So I have, um, I went through a, a task that, you know, should have been awakened, but it took me a couple months of simplifying everything. I organized my dresser, I organized my closet, I organized my junk drawer. I bought little containers to pack them so I could always find a pack. So that if you simplify things, simplify things in your life, it makes it so much easier. You make things where you can reach them without having to try to stand on something because you're probably going to fall off because your grandma forgot that day or whatever, you know? Simplify. You know, have you guys heard of the Happiness Project, Gretchen Rubin? She did a whole series of like every day she wrote a blog, finding happiness in others. Like she did research like around people and stuff. So she, anyway, she wrote a story, but this I love, a quote from her, um, her Happiness Project. Says, Studies show that the best way to lift your mood, and this is true, I thought about this before and I practice it on a regular basis, but she, is, she often quoted this book, she did a quote, even though I thought that worked. <laughs> The best way to lift your mood is to engineer an easy success, such as tackling a long delayed chore. So if I feel like crap and everything's out of control and my house is driving me nuts, if I make my bed, that is a success. And then I feel fine because at least my bed is made. So I make my bed every morning because that is an easy success that I can do almost every morning. Sometimes I need help because the covers are too heavy, but <laughs> it happens. And that makes me feel good. Name it. When you have horrible, horrible symptoms of MS that are uncontrollable and the worst symptoms I think, for me, because you know, pain sucks and immobility sucks and weakness sucks, but the worst one for me is depression. And I get it fairly regularly, and I know that it is a symptom of my disease, and I'm lucky to know that, because I never was depressed before I had MS, and it was actually my first symptom, so I don't care what doctors say that it's not a symptom of your disease because it doesn't make sense, I've heard people say that, it is, because I was not depressed before I had MS, and I got depressed before I knew I had MS, but when depression hits, it takes over everything, and it takes away all your rational thoughts. So instead of driving down, if there's a difference between being sad, you can drive down the road and listen to music and go, oh, I'm kind of sad, life sucks right now, oh well. Or you're driving down the road and you're not listening to music and you're not thinking about anything except, God, I hate myself, I'm no good to anybody, everybody would be better behind, without me. What if I just veered this way a little bit next time a truck comes? That's depression. And you have to learn to recognize it right away. You name it and then you realize, okay, this is not rational, it's not how I feel, I know I'm not, you know, not needed in this world. I know my kids need me, my husband needs me. Um, so, yes? Um, SB Brain Health, OHSU sponsored seminar last fall. Mm -hmm. One of the researchers said that the MS brain is much more susceptible to anxiety and depression than a normal brain. So it, 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 it is now, has been studied, it is a symptom of MS. 
Thank you. Thank you. I felt the way to hear that my whole <laughs> Thank you. Um, part of my team right there. Um, she, so, yeah. So, when these things happen to you, you have to name them. Throw it out there and say, hey, I'm depressed. This is not me speaking. I need to refocus, reevaluate, get through this, and move on. Because you can't just accept it and let it go on. You have to take care of it right away, or you're going to get in trouble. Seriously. Scary start for me. And, okay, finding your own equation to happiness. This is my favorite. I was really excited to talk about this, because I have found my own equation to happiness. But my, I could tell you all about my equation, but everybody's equation is different. So you have to figure out what your equation is. I found my equation of happiness by, um, honestly, by starting my blog about a year and a half ago. And I would talk about, I would write about, um, and my blog's on my card. I hope you all got the card on the way out. I um, think about what's going on and then how to turn it into something positive. And I, you know, blog about what makes me feel good, what, you know, something, if I had something happen really great one day, that's how I found my equation of happiness. Like what turns me into, like what I need to be happy every day. Every day starts in there. So, first step, I think, is finding my happiness. In this society, we are kind of told that um, if we talk about how good we are, then we're, you know, we really need to be humble. And if people give you a compliment, okay. I totally disagree with this. I totally disagree with this. I think that you should not walk around bragging and boasting and saying you're better than anybody else. But if you just did something awesome, great. Call it out. Say, hey, I ran this morning. That's how cool I am. Say, you know, whatever, you're all awesome because you showed up here today. You're doing something because you want to feel better. You came here because you thought you could get something out of it. So you're doing something for forward movement. That makes you awesome. <laughs> Why else are you awesome? Shout out your awesomeness. I'm awesome because I painted my toes a really cool color. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you awesome? Huh? I got dressed up today. I was just going to say Awesome. <laughs> We admire these traits in others, we're attracted to others, so why don't we admire them in ourselves? So I actually have this mirror that, um, to remind me of that sometimes, I um, put on little sticky notes of things I did, or things I want to do, or things that I want to be, and um, I'm going to talk about that later a little bit, but it never hurts to remind yourself of your awesomeness, and write it down. You know, I'm awesome because of this and this and this, and it really does boost your mood. And there's nothing wrong with playing those traits that you admire in others and seek out in others. Because they're not just traits that you are pretending you have or that are given to you, they're traits that you strive for, right? You work hard to be a pleasant person to be around. Can you tell you guys these little bitches in the morning? The best possible you. Every morning, I learned this from my mom. Every morning, I wake up and I make a vow to myself to be the best person I can be. I vow to be more patient with my children. I vow to know that everybody else around me is being having the, being the best men they can be, so I will be less judgmental with them. I vow to make the best out of my day. I vow to do something for somebody else today that is not just for me. Or I vow to do something to take great care of myself today because I really need it but I vow to be the best me I can be that day. And let that be enough. Know that I am trying to be the best me I can be. So if something happens and I feel bad about something, you know what, I was frustrated, I was in pain, I tried to be the best me I can be and I can let it go. Um, one of the ways I do that is when I do little mirrors telling you about it. I remind myself of all the traits I want. This is um, on my mirror beside, like where I get ready every morning. Um, Obviously, I spend a lot of time. Uh, I, um, the, but I put stuff up there like um, calm, patient, happy, cheery. And then if I feel like it's something that I've been striving for that I mastered, I'll take it off and put something else up. I have one that says dance. We don't dance enough. Why not? Kids dance. Music plays. You want to dance? Dance. Do what you want to do that makes you happy. I think that we need more of that. So... Do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. Always try to do better.
doing your best. And if you're doing your best, that's all you need. So you can be happy and know that you're a great person because you're doing the best. That's all you can do. Random happiness. <laughs> I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. When I became a man, I put away the childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. <laughs> the fact is, happiness happens the best in children. Um, I don't know how many of you have young children, but it's just amazing how it happens. They're like, face lights up, and they can be so upset, but then something makes them happy, and they just light up, and they it's so pretty, it's so, you know, they can laugh, and as adults, we kind of let those moments slip by us, because we've got stuff to do, we're trying to get somewhere, we've got to get the grocery shopping done, we need to regain this, and focus more on it, I think. Um, we all need to be better at being children, and letting happiness happen. One time, that's my kids. I wasn't that happy because I had to go out and take a nap, go like an asshole, but they're completely happy because they're going to get candy. Why was I completely happy because I could get candy? Because I forgot to be a child. <laughs> um, my favorite story about this happened um, on a camping trip. We were, um, I was with my parents, my husband, and my kids, and my niece, Angelica, and we had gone, um, we were camping from spot to spot, and it was hot really hot, and so I'm like jumping in the water every 10 minutes to cool down because it just made me feel really bad, and everybody was kind of hot and miserable, and then as it cooled down at night, and we um, opened up the cooler, the parents were sitting, you know, we're all sitting around the table laughing and talking and enjoying the company, and as any good mom would do when my two-year-old got really tired, I said, okay, Angelica, why don't you go take her into the tent and lie down, so I could continue talking and having fun. Um, so I went at night. When it was time to go to bed, I took my two-year-old out of the tent and crept to bed. And my mom told me the next morning, as we were getting breakfast ready, she told me about when she got into the tent and Angelica was in there. Angelica, my niece, who I had had put my baby to bed, said, um, she goes, I'm just having a random moment of happiness, and I'm just so happy, and I just think it's so great. This happens to me sometimes, just random happiness, and I just think it's awesome. And I feel so good right now, and I just, I'm going to talk about a lot of things. I think this is so cool. And the fact is, they still happen. We just don't notice them. As adults, we're trained to get stuff done. You gotta get the product finished, you gotta show up for work, you gotta do the grocery shopping, you gotta get stuff done. So when a random moment of happiness happens, we don't take the time to appreciate it. Nor do we take the time to realize what led up to that moment so that we can remember how to recreate it. And that is what one of my new goals for this year is. Taking all those random moments of happiness and running with them. Keep them right here. And remembering how they got here because I want to recreate them. And remembering happiness even after it makes you happy. Like you don't you can be in a horrible mood, but remember something great and you're happy. So that is a skill that everybody should work on, I believe. There are way too many adults in this world. Um, because we can be inspired to by what you can do every day. Um, every day we cannot do everything. But sometimes we can. I um, I so there's I talk about running a lot because that's my thing. I just how it calms me down, it puts my mind more at ease, it's how I deal with anxiety, and it's how I get away for a half hour in my own head and be able to think and feel normal. Because when I run So um, and I talk about that a lot, so I apologize because I don't know what you're about. But um, it's a good story. So there's this path by my house, and um, I always run by it. There's this, like, just like right when you get to the path, there's a hill that goes up. It's really steep and muddy. So I always think, oh, I'll run that on the way back because that'll be a really good boost to the end of my run. And I never do because it's either looks too muddy or I'm too tired. Usually it's if I'm too tired, I'm like, I'll just do it the next day. And one day, I'm running by it, and I ran back by it, and I'm like, oh, I'll do it the next, the next time, not yet. And this has been going on for like a year, right? Ridiculous. So I said, I stopped, wiped my tracks, I said, bullshit. I turned around and I went to that, um, that hill, and I ran up the hill, and it took two seconds. It wasn't a big deal, but I did it. Why? Because I could. Not because I had to, because I could. And that 
felt like a huge accomplishment to me. I did it because I could. Because I know I can't always. So it's important as you do things just to take a chance to remind yourself that you can because you can't always, unfortunately. Mind and body passion. So this is what I talk about running. Um, this is, so we went um, up on a camping trip with just my husband, my kids, and I, and it was going to be to this great woods that we really wanted to see, and Lake Quinault, I think it was called. And I was really excited to get there because they had all these trails, and I, could, I was really excited. I hadn't run in a long time. I usually can only run in the morning because I don't have the energy, but I've just been sitting in the car, and I thought, well, I can do a slow run. And um, so we get there, and it's raining. Then I realized I can't see my iPod, which I usually use my music. And so I'm like, well, I'm not going to go run in the rain without my iPod. And then I didn't want to leave my husband home alone with the kids. We got in later than I wanted. And then I looked, I saw a pamphlet on a table of all the trails we have around there. And so I said, Josh, you carry his note, Rachel. Go, go, go. Because he knows I get to the ditch. He's like, don't. So <laughs> he's like, go run. So then we can relax. And, um, so I went running without my iPod, and at first I'm like, this stinks. But then the more I ran, I realized the rain and just feeling my body move, the mind and body connection without the outside of the, um, the music and knowing exactly what pace I'm going, exactly how far, which is also what I use it for, um, without knowing any of this and just doing what my body felt was natural to do. And it makes like all the other stuff, I can't feel it, all I feel is my body moving. My mind is connected to my body as a machine. That connection without outside interference, I think is such a blessing. Because so you can recognize the good things you feel in your body also, not just the bad things. There's so many bad things you can feel in your body or things you just don't feel at all. And that's crummy also. I mean, so to make every once in a while take stock of that mind and body connection can really be really helps me like mind over matter. Visualization. This is one of my best keys for sometimes. So I know everybody's in this system. But my MS, the, one of the biggest problems for me is pain. I get um, some pretty severe pain sometimes and I am very, very aware of how many drugs I take. And then they give me side effects so I take more drugs to counteract those side effects. And then I get used to the medicine, so I take more drugs. And I do not want to ruin all my organs while the rest of my body is falling apart anyway. So I'm very conscious about that. So sometimes I get a go on these little things and I just say, hey, I don't have MS anymore. I'm not going to take any medicine. I'm fine. And um, then the pain happens. So what do I do? <laughs> visualize. I have a special place I go and I visualize it. And that can. Take, I'll tell you about that later. That can take all the pain away. If you can really get to that place, it can take all your pain away. And it actually works for hours, not just that moment. After you're done, it can work also. And it helps with mood a lot. Like when I'm freaking out, it's really hard to call me. <laughs> this is a, that's a picture of my son right there. And the turtles. <laughs> um, live as if. There's, they say that all the time in um, like for sales. Live as if. Live as if you own, or act as if. Act as if you own this company. Act as if you have already got the sale. You know, act as if and you'll get there. I say live as if. So I often have days, like I just mentioned, where I'm like, I don't have a mess. I am so sick of having a mess and feeling like crap. I don't have a mess today. So I feel great. I'm awesome. Things are awesome. And it works. I swear to God, it works for at least half a day. <laughs> but that half a day is more than I had the day before. And sometimes you just have to not worry about how tired you're going to get later today. Because honestly, I'm going to get tired later today whether I do anything this morning or not. So I'm going to live as if I can do whatever I want. And then when I get tired, we'll be able to get done. But live as if everything's okay and you can do what you want. Because if you don't, you'll end up never doing anything again. And that's not what we want. That's the opposite of what we're seeking here. <laughs> the 
going to sleep. Everybody today, every day today, that could be awesome. But don't put everything off just because you, you 
do it later because if it can make you happy now, you're missing a lot of happiness if you're screaming off until later. Everything in moderation. This is where I realized that um, I am no longer super mom. <laughs> I could do anything. I ran, even with the mask, I um, trained for a marathon with two little kids in a jogging stroller. I ran 18 miles pushing them in a jogging stroller. And I um, did I did something with them every day. Took them somewhere every day. I went to work and I came home and I did something every day. And I cooked dinner every day, a healthy dinner. Uh, and I, you know, I was on this kick. We're gonna have fresh vegetables and meat every day. And you know, I'm gonna juice every day. And I did all this stuff. And the fact is, life happens in chapters, and I have entered a new chapter in my life. I am no longer a super mom. But I can still do these things. I can still be a great mom. I can still work out. I just can't do it full bloom all the time. Everything in moderation. Don't stop doing them because they're hard. Just do it a little less. Because it's okay not to be perfect. Turns out.